okay good afternoon uh, welcome everybody to this uh, data to insight center seminar series and today we have our speaker dr mariam rahane munfar and today she will be talking on a very important on an important topic on uh, synthetic aperture radar interferometry for 3D modeling and earthquake monitoring. Dr. Moriam is visiting scholar uh, in Data to Insight Center at Indiana uh, University. And she received her PhD from uh, Salford University, Manchester, United Kingdom in 2010. And she has been working as uh, a student professor in uh, Geomet Geoinformatics Department uh, at Isfahan University in Iran. Her research interests lie in image processing, computer vision, and applications to remote sensing, medical imaging. So please welcome our speaker, Dr. Mariam. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Abby, and uh, thanks uh, everyone, and thank you uh, for having me and inviting me to this center. So, <clears throat> is it? So today I'm going to talk about synthetic aperture radar interferometry for three-dimensional modeling and earthquake monitoring. Uh, but first I would like to give an introduction about remote sensing because I asked several people in the uh, center and nobody knows what is remote sensing. So I'm wondering if can uh, anyone guess what is remote sensing? Yes? Yes, so sensing from remotes. Um, it is a, this definition by United Nations is given that remote sensing means sensing of the Earth's surface from space by making the properties of electromagnetic wave, which, are, which is emitted or reflected by the object for the purpose of improving natural resource management, land use, and the prote and protection of the environment. But actually, it is not only sensing uh, the, uh, uh, from satellite, sensing the Earth from satellite, but any remote contact that we don't have, uh, in, in any case, that we don't have any contact with the object, it is uh, remote sensing. Shall I close it? So the remote sensing goals is to improving natural resources, management, protection of the environment, and improve the quality of life locally and globally. So what kind of issues exist in the environment? Um, I'm going to refer you to this website, uh, National Resources Defense Council in the United States. And their priority issues is air pollution, water pollution, endangered wildlife. Uh, it, issues in food and agriculture and water and climate change, like drought or uh, flooding. So the uh, remote sensing can address most of these issues. Or uh, Hoosier Environment Council, they have also uh, issues with food and agri agriculture and water and uh, healthy environment. So, um, one way to acquire a special data from the real world is to go directly to the um, uh, object and measure directly. And the other way is to use a sensor, like satellite image or any uh, sensor image, and work on that image uh, and measure the image and then have observation and measurement. So indirectly, you uh, measure the object. So what kind of advantages we can have with this remote sensing? It is so quick. Uh, 
and it uh, has a um, very broad spectral sensitivity because uh, as you can see this uh, in this uh, uh, spectrum uh, human eye can see only these parts but uh, with satellite image we can have uh, image of all this spectrum so uh, we have a broadened spectral and we can see more with these satellite images and we can extend our ground observation or for some places like Amazon or for other planets that we don't have any access, we can use remote sensing. Or uh, we can compare data over the time from this month to next month or from this year to next year. And it is um, very cheap, this method, and we can get up-to-date information over a large geographical area. So the whole remote sensing process is that uh, first we have uh, energy source or illumination and um, this energy source can be uh, from the sun or from the satellite itself. And then um, it passes through atmosphere, interacts with the objects and reflects back to the sensor and will be processed by ground stations and will be interpret and analyze and then we can use it for uh, several applications. So uh, to see uh, how we can measure um, the object and how we can have information of the, about the object, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this. So our energy source is in the form of electromagnetic uh, spectrum, electromagnetic radiation and as I said it uh, can and see a um, wider range. And uh, it can be active or passive. Pass uh, active is that the uh, satellite uh, provide uh, its source of energy, like radar or uh, leader. But uh, with optical sensor, we have sun as the, the um, <coughs> source of energy. So this is. Uh, act, uh, passive sensor and these are active sensors. And uh, then it's a, this uh, light will interact with atmosphere. So atmosphere uh, has a tremendous uh, effect on the light uh, <clears throat> because some um, part of the uh, this wave will be absorbed by the atmosphere. Some of them will be uh, scattered. So uh, the light that uh, the sensor measure is not uh, only from the uh, object that we are studying. It's coming from other objects and also coming from atmosphere. So it is always important to study the atmosphere effect. And then this light interacts with the uh, object. So some part of this uh, incoming energy will absorb by the object. Some of them will reflect back and some of them will transmit through the object. And because the reflectance of um, material is different from one object to another, so we can have information about the shape and um, also the material. So as you can see, this uh, road uh, that uh, has a specular reflection and this tree has diffuse reflection, it means that it's a uh, scatter light in all uh, directions so we can have information about the shape of the object and also because each material has a unique spectral reflectance we can distinguish between um, different materials and uh, so each um, object uh, has a unique signature and uh, for example here we can differentiate between grass tree and the uh, different uh, type of object. So uh, with remote sensing, we can uh, have this kind of information. And uh, then uh, <clears throat> this uh, energy go back to the sensor and we have passive sensors um, like photographic that have color image, multi-spectral that have um, five or seven spectral bands, uh, including colors and infrared and thermal infrared. And we have hyperspectral that have hundreds of bands. 
and passive microwave. And <clears throat> we have also active sensors like radar or uh, lidar. And today I'm going to talk about these active sensors. And then after that, uh, this um, uh, reflected energy will be uh, processed by the satellite and by ground stations. And uh, then we have um, something in, in the form of image. And we can interpret and analyze that. Um, so image analysts uh, do this an uh, analyzation. This analysis, uh, and we can use for different kind of application in agriculture, forestry, geology, hydrology, sea ice, land cover and land use, mapping, uh, ocean monitoring, meteorology, and disaster management. And today I'm going to talk about mapping and disaster management. So uh, remote sensing is very multidisciplinary because um, uh, if you are image analyst, uh, and you can use uh, um, your image for different applications. You need uh, some experts from this discipline. And if uh, uh, you are from one of these disciplines, you need image analysts or remote sensing analysts to uh, use uh, remote sensing for your application. So I'm uh, not going um, to all details of this application, but I think you can study this. Uh, later, because presentation will be available online. So for agriculture, you can use for crop type classification and assessment for, in forestry for invention of new forests and new species, in geology for mineral exploration, in hydrology for, for example, river and delta change or flood mapping, in sea ice for um, detecting type or age or motion of sea in land cover and land use, for example, for urban expansion or natural resource management. In mapping, you know, we can use it for three-dimensional modeling, digital elevation model, or two-dimensional map or thematic mapping. In ocean, uh, we can use uh, for ocean pattern identification and uh, we can use remote sensing for risk management, like in flooding, volcano, tsunami, fire, earthquake. And today I'm going to talk about earthquake. So synthetic aperture, radar, interferometry. Uh, does anyone have idea about what is SAR, synthetic aperture radar? All right. So what is synthetic aperture radar? We have radar. So radar is active sensor, and it is side looking. It looks uh, at side. It doesn't look at na nature. And uh, it measures the time delay between transmission and reception of a pulse. So it has several uh, advantages to optical image. Because uh, it is active sensor, it uh, doesn't depend on sunlight, so it can work in day and night. And also, it can work in all weather. In, so uh, the cloud or a smoke uh, doesn't prevent the light because uh, it has a longer wavelength. And also, it is more sensitive to geometric shape and surface roughness. And also, it can penetrate through soil, snow, and vegetation. And as I said, it uh, covers several band octaves of the spectrum. And uh, so SAR, uh, we have real aperture radar and synthetic aperture radar. By synthetic aperture radar, it mean, uh, I mean that uh, we construct the antenna of the radar synthetically. We don't have real aperture because for increasing the resolution, we need a long antenna. But because it is impossible to have this long antenna in the space, we construct it synthetically. And uh, the other difference between uh, SAR image and normal optical image is that for optical image, uh, you have this gray level for each uh, pixel. But uh, for SAR image, we have 
uh, complex number that have real part and imaginary part, and we have phase and amplitude. So for generating three-dimensional model, we can use radar geometry that doesn't use phase information, or we can use shape from shading. It is only one single image. And we, uh, the best method is interferometry that uh, you, you will use the phase information in the image. It is more complicated, but at the same time more accurate. So what is SAR or synthetic aperture radar interferometry? SAR is using two coherent SAR images. Sorry, interferometry is using two coherent, by coherent I mean uh, using phase information as well. So using two coher coherent SAR image to, uh, <clears throat> that are taken with a time delay or cross-track parallax. And parallax means uh, the distance between uh, the antenna of two satellite image to detect height or motion. And we are going to talk about, I'm going to talk about this too today. So if we have time delay and zero parallax, we can get pure motion. Uh, if we have zero time delay and selected cross parallax, we can extract pure height. But in most case, we have both time delay and parallax, so we should uh, <clears throat> separate them. And it has a uh, several application. If we use an uh, interferometric phase, we can use it for three-dimensional modeling. If we use differential interferometric phase, uh, it means uh, using three images or uh, <clears throat> somehow remove the topographic uh, component. If we use differential interferometric phase, we can use it for deviation of surface displacements, or also uh, for earthquake damage to historical structure. For example, I presented a short course in Germany several years ago and, and to see how with um, ground-based radar we can monitor the cracks and the change by earthquake to historical structures. And also we can um, study different changes because of volcano, earthquake, Subsidence due to oil and gas extraction and etc. And also interferometric coherence. Coherence means correlation between two satellite, uh, two SAR image. We can use that for land cover classification. So the processing of interferometric image is that we have one master image and one uh, slave image. And we co-register co them together, means that we align pixels together. And we produce interferogram. Uh, that means multiplying one uh, SAR image to complex conjugates of another, or uh, subtracting phase of this image from the other one. So we create interferogram. But this interferogram has, uh, the phase has been wrapped. It means that it is um, uh, mapped between minus pi and pi. So we need to recover that or do phase unwrapping. And then after phase unwrapping, we can convert this to height information. So the most critical and complicated step is phase unwrapping. Because if you have a flat object, uh, then maybe it is easy to reconstruct uh, this wrapped phase, reconstruct this one to this one. But when you have topography and height change, it is very difficult, and especially in the, uh, when you have noise. And also, if you, um, because this um, topographic map have um, have a direct relationship with the <clears throat> phase. So it is important to have accurate phase unwrapping, accurate phase to convert it to height. And uh, if we have wrongly interpreted multiple of 
through pi, it can lead to height error of several tens of meters. So there are uh, different uh, type uh, for phase unwrapping. Um, one accurate one, and if it's fast, also is less uh, least square methods. So least square uh, approach is um, minimizing the difference between discrete partial der uh, derivatives of the wrapped phase and the unwrapped solution. And then you have this equation. And the classical method to solve this uh, equation is Gauss-Seidel, but Gauss-Seidel converge, converge too extremely slowly. But uh, we can have a solution for that. And I propose a solution, because uh, this um, Gauss-Seidel uh, <clears throat> removed the high-frequency component of the error very rapidly, but the low-frequency extremely slowly. So <clears throat> I propose to transform the low-frequency component of error into high-frequency component. And I use wavelet to do that. So if uh, you transfer the low-frequency to high-frequency level by wavelet, that I'm not going to explain about the detail, because it needs at least two hours to explain about it, then so uh, transfer this image to higher level, and this higher, in this higher level, you have low frequency and high frequency. And then um, we can solve the equation here in this high frequency, and it con uh, the equation converges so quickly. And then for this part, again, we use another wavelet transform and go to uh, next level, solve equation. and. After going to um, several levels, um, I um, went to up to seven levels. Then we can go back and synthesize the uh, signal. And uh, in this regard, we have a quicker result and more accurate. So I did some simulation. Uh, I created this function. and. Uh, as you can see, the high uh, is between 0 and 25. And then I unwrap it. It means that I um, convert it to minus pi and plus pi. And then with waveless <coughs> technique and ghost cycle, as you can see with ghost cycle, even after a uh, thousand uh, iteration, it doesn't uh, reconstruct the original function. But with wavelet, uh, in a couple of seconds, we can reconstruct it. And the accuracy is so high. And so the error is almost zero. It is close to original function, if we subtract this one from the original function. And this is another simulation that I did. Uh, this is original function with uh, noise. And this is wrapped function. And this is unwrapped one with wavelet. Uh, we, uh, in noise part, we have problem. And later, I use uh, some weight function to uh, correct that. But I'm not going to explain it here. It is more complicated. So because of the noise, the error is higher than the previous case. And another simulation, this is fractal function. This is wrapped function. And this is unwrapped. And Again, the error, so subtracting this function from the original function, the error is very low. And um, I um, applied my algorithms to real images, um, to, to NVSAT image from the BAM area. NVSAT uh, has um, its Earth observation environment satellites, and it has different a sensor uh, for interferometry, I'm going to use this advanced synthetic aperture radar sensors. And this ASAR sensor has different modes. Uh, one is image mode that cover 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, and resolution is 30 meter. And we have wide SWAT mode uh, that covers 
1000 by 1000 kilometer and resolution is 150 meter. Then we have alternating polarization that use different polarization for transmitting, transmitting and backscatter, horizontal, vertical, different polarization. And we have, sorry, we have wave mode, which is this one, to, for studying uh, and detecting wave on the ocean. It is 5 by 5 kilometer. And um, <clears throat> global uh, monitoring, we have this mode uh, that cover um, thousand by thousand uh, <clears throat> kilometer, and the resolution is around 400 meters. So we have this master image and this slave image, and uh, I. Uh, created the whole three-dimensional model of this, but uh, to study and to evaluate my method, I focus on some you know, region. So region one is Fahraj, this is interferogram, and this is phase unwrapping by wavelet. Then uh, on this grid, I created the height information, so convert the phase to the height. And uh, to evaluate it, uh, I had uh, this, um, map uh, from ground observation. And uh, this is the uh, difference between uh, height uh, created by my method and by ground observation. And uh, this is another phase unwrapping method. Uh, and as you can see, the wavelet was uh, faster and the error was less. And this is another region. Again, we did the same thing and uh, compare it with ground observation. And <clears throat> the error was around 2 meters. And this is digital elevation model of whole area. And this is 2 meters. The second case of study is for Turkey earthquake. Um, so <clears throat> for measuring motion, we need differential interferometry. And uh, as I said, we need to remove the um, <clears throat> topographic components. And for removing topographic, either the baseline, the um, stand, um, sorry, the distance between two satellites um, must be very uh, small to be neglected or accurate digital elevation model from ground observation must be used, or at least three passes must be used. And I use this technique. So three satellite images, at least we need to reconstruct the face. So for, uh, for Turkey area, we had a different image before, sat uh, before earthquake and uh, two image uh, after. So with uh, two images before earthquake, we reconstruct the topography. And uh, with one image, actually, I um, tested on several images, and I'm just presenting one of them. So uh, <clears throat> with uh, one image before and one image after earthquake, we can monitor the uh, motion. So these fringes shows that uh, the <clears throat> motion between uh, two uh, image or uh, <clears throat> deformation because of the earthquake. So <clears throat> we can uh, measure uh, <clears throat> the uh, horizontal deformation and vertical deformations, for example, uh, with, remote, uh, with this method, uh, the horizontal deformation was around 2 met meter. And uh, by the way, the differential interferometry has very high uh, accuracy, around a uh, few millimeter, because uh, it, is, um, it uh, depends on the fractions of wavelengths. And because we ha have very small wavelengths, it is very around a few millimeter 
accuracy. And uh, for this case, I used the satellite images before earthquake to see if we had any deformation before earthquake as well or not. And um, so this is one image before earthquake. This is the second image before earthquake. And as you can see, there are uh, still uh, fringes before earthquake. So we can use this method to monitor, I mean, sorry, to forecast the uh, earthquake. Because before earthquake, uh, still there are some uh, deformation. And it is because of the uh, pre-earthquake motion. And uh, for uh, another case study, um, again, I use uh, differential interferometry for BAM area. This is optical images before and after. So uh, we need at least three images, uh, two before earthquake and uh, one after earthquakes to remove the topographic component. So these two before and this one after. And we have this interferogram before that shows the topography. And this uh, before and after shows both topography and motion. And this is the differential interferogram interferogram after removing the uh, height component. As you can see, it shows also the epicenter of the earthquake. And we can have uh, displacement. Uh, we can measure the displacement for different area with counting these fringes. So for example, for BAM area, uh, the <clears throat> displacement was uh, horizontal displacement was 78 centimeter and vertical was 33 centimeter. And also, uh, we can detect uh, the earthquake magnitude. Uh, for, uh, and with this INSAR method, we got 6.3. <clears throat> and we compare it with other uh, ground based method, and as you can see, it is so accurate. So these two are ground-based method, and this one is SAR interferometer. So uh, the conclusion. These methods give a two-dimensional representation of the formation of the image strain. As you uh, so uh, we have a continuous image of the deformation. It is not like GPS methods or some leveling methods that have point-wise inf information. We can have continuous information. And it is um, sensitive to a small train deformation. It has a very large spatial extent, 100 by 100 kilometer, and a very high spatial resolution. It is available for. <coughs> large time series so we can predict and monitor earthquake for a long time. And so it represents a, a supreme ca capability for earthquake study comparing to traditional geodetic techniques. But it has uh, some limitation. We can use it. Uh, we cannot use it when coherence or correlation between two images low, or uh, we cannot use it when topography is steep. And um, we need uh, to use weight function for wavelet to increase the accuracy. And as I said, I did this later. And uh, it improved the accuracy. And uh, integration of SAR images with other satellite images also is recommended to improve the accuracy. And thank you very much for your attention. Any question? Mm-hmm. 
For this uh, spectral reflectance, we have um, some spectral uh, reflectance library. So people have gone to the Earth and had direct uh, <clears throat> measurements from Earth, ground through thing, yes. And then with satellite, you see this spectral reflectance. Uh, and uh, um, so, uh, <clears throat> but it is for a limited place for a limited area. You do, you do this ground truthing and observation, and you have this library. But for other area, you can compare your the signature by the satellite and this library and say, all right, this is grass, and this is tree, and this is et cetera. Is so we graph, need, we need, need I'm sorry? The graph you were showing that it only really shows no, no, no. Uh, I mean, um, uh, it is not for a particular area. It is for particular area. You do this ground truthing, but for the whole area, because uh, the grass, uh, the signature for grass, uh, is similar in all, all different area. It depends on moisture and other thing as well. But uh, if uh, you know the characteristics, and you can use it for other areas. So it is not for a limited area. Uh, for example, mm, when you have, uh, where is that? Yes. Um, when we have this signature, it is um, for all kind of grass. But uh, for example, if, um, uh, or for tree, for example, we have this, for, all, uh, for different kind of tree, we have different kind of signature. But uh, for example, if um, the tree is um, dry, then the signature is different from the green tree. And then you can distinguish between. So uh, we can uh, study also the disease of the trees. And because in different condition, they have different signature. But these signatures are available in a library. And when you have, uh, <clears throat> so for example, if you get another, uh, how, how can I say? Uh, we do this in. Um, in medical images, for example, for uh, I don't know, for something like uh, teeth or eye, yeah, you have um, one uh, uh, unique reflectance, and if it is uh, healthy, uh, if uh, this uh, teeth is healthy, then uh, you have this signature. But if you have another signature for another teeth, you can see that this um, teeth has a problem. So, uh, and you go and find this problem. For trees also, if it is green tree and, uh, and green grass it doesn't have any, for example, iron material, they have unique signature. But if it's um, other things, uh, for example, dry or dryness or um, I don't know, some uh, chemical uh, matters affect that with uh, comparing this uh, signature, we can detect the disease and the substance. And so it's sort of, if, if they know there's a tree there, then they can look at this curve and say, how good is that tree doing? But they don't know if there's a tree there. All the lines sort of cross, so you really can't say. And it depends uh, on uh, uh, which sensor do you, do they use. Do you know which sensor? Uh, 
For example, if uh, you want a very uh, specific uh, sig uh, signature for each one, maybe multi-spectral image is not uh, enough for you. Multi-spectral ha has only seven bands. But you need hyperspectral. Hyperspectral have hundreds of bands in this uh, in uh, this wavelength, and uh, with hyperspectral, yes, we can easily distinguish between different material, between di different kind of trees and different. Oh, okay. So it depends which images they use. Oh, okay. yeah. So uh, you have master and slave. Yes. So what are those? Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. Um, it is two images. You. Uh, so is it like one is uh, the signal is sent to the ground? Mm -hmm. Two receptors? Can say. No, no. It is um, when you send the signal, you don't have any image, but you have an uh, image from reflectance. So these two images are from reflectance, and master and a slave. Um, doesn't mean anything. It means just you have two typical images. Two and, receptors. Uh, no, no, no. Just one receptor. You have um, two images over uh, two uh, period of time or two passes of the earthquake, of, uh, sorry, of the satellite. Because the satellite. Uh, so is there any distance between you uh, when, uh, because interferometry means you need to observe one object mm -hmm. from two different locations, mm -hmm. and then you need to uh, measure what is the interference between the signal received mm -hmm. from these two Yes, there is, uh, there is a difference between, because when satellite passes mm -hmm. uh, from that object and it looks at different direction, okay. so uh, it uh, gets the image from different location, and uh, the uh, the distance between two antennas this, or between the center of uh, this uh, image, two images, is the baseline. So master and slave doesn't mean anything. It means just you uh, have two images that are taken in two different times or from two different locations. And you okay, so as the satellite is going, I take one... Uh Yes. Here and then yes. and another image here. Yes. And but because it is. Should I be losing a signal at the time when I am taking signal here? I already send the ray or beam, mm -hmm. and the signal is coming. So I got the signal here, and then I got the signal here. But in the meantime, I am not accepting or receiving the same signal. The signal is weakened or some. Where it is uh, deviated from the. No, source, uh, right? it is. Um, so shouldn't I observe uh, the same signal from two different locations at the same time? Um, uh, you you mean for topography I mean, or for or uh, for topography or for for three dimensional modeling or for deformation? Which one do you mean? For measuring uh, deform motion. Or arc monitoring. For topography, uh, we uh, need uh, two uh, radar image from two different locations, and because it is two different paths, uh, because this satellite uh, repeat uh, this its cycle after 35 days, and when we use uh, topography, yeah, uh, we assume that there is no motion between this. 35 days, <laughs> and also uh, we uh, we use some atmospheric correction. Uh, if uh, because always we have two different conditions between two image, two atmospheric conditions. So always we need to do atmospheric correction, and I did in this part, but I didn't say say so, detail. So, so my, my question was: uh, so if we observe from two different locations, mm -hmm. so what? What should be the minimum distance between these two locations to observe one uh, object? Yes, um, we have um, something named critical baseline. So the baseline, if um, it is uh, too long, 
then the correlation, or as you say, the signal, uh, the correlation will be low, yes. And if uh, the baseline is so close, uh, then we have other problems. So uh, we have critical baseline. It cannot be uh, bigger or smaller than it, it should be within some limits. But as I said, with satellite, we get hundreds of images from one area. And uh, for topography, at least we need two images. And uh, this two image uh, by master and a slave, I mean that we uh, get, we have one image. And uh, for core registration, uh, I align, because it is from two different locations, I align this image with so I align the slave with mass. That's. So is there any case that uh, there are some observations that you cannot make from one satellite? You need to uh, cooperate with different satellites the interferometry between these. Uh, is the, is for the interferometry, I can, uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot use other satellites like optical satellite because, as I said, interferometry needs phase information, and it is only radar that have uh, this phase information. Other optical satellite has only gray value. So uh, uh, yes, with um, interferometry, um, we um, can, um, for example, for some area, I, I told that uh, to not use interferometry for uh, area when the coherence or the correlation between two images is so low. So if, um, and usually for um, cities, we have this problem. The correlation between two images are so low. Or uh, for, uh, I don't know, for very steep area or for high mountains, we cannot use uh, interferometry. So there are some limitations. So we cannot use, you cannot uh, synchronize multiple satellites or stations, and then we can use other uh, other um, uh, three-dimensional modeling technique, but not interferometry. Or we can use interferometry to get uh, three-dimensional modeling from the part that has high coherency and use other satellites for uh, low coherency area, and then uh, integrate and uh, have integrate those images to have complete three-dimensional model. I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that the Gauss-Seidel method uh, needs a lot of iteration yeah. compared to the wavelet-based approach that you propose. And so in terms of physical uh, things that are happening there, why uh, the Gauss-Seidel method fails? So what is the limitation of the computation there? Um, because um, this ghost idol meta, um, ghost idol uh, approach um, in in the matrix, this where is that? This matrix is a sparse matrix. So it has lots of zero. And for that reason, uh, there, uh, it is extremely uh, slow. And when we study the ghost idle method, we see that uh, in high, coherence, uh, high uh, frequency parts, it converts very uh, fast, but in Low frequency area, it converts very uh, slow. So with wavelets, we uh, transform image to another level that has low frequency information and high frequency. And because we know that then with, uh, we use ghost-sided method, 
in this area, and because it is high frequency information, then it converts very uh, fast. And then again, for these parts, we, uh, we transform it. Any other question? All right, thank you very much for your presentation.